Chapter 15. We end the day in a place called Grass Market. Of course, there's no grass, and I don't see any signs of a market. Just a wide open plaza surrounded by shops and pubs. The castle looms behind the building like an eerie sentinel. But the plaza itself is nice, airy, open. This isn't so bad, I think. Right before mum tells me that it used to be an execution ground. Why am I even surprised? Sure enough, as we follow the crew across the square, the veil thickens around my arms and legs until it feels like I'm walking through water. The only reason I don't get pulled in is because my mind is still stuck on Laura Chowdhury, her mirror necklace, her strange incantation and the way the ghost fell apart at her feet. This is what we do. Jacob fidgets nervously beside me. We haven't talked anymore about what happened in the alley, about what he meant when he said he was afraid to tell me, but now's not the time. So we do our best to pretend that nothing's wrong. Dad gestures to a low stone slab, a marker on the ground. See that, Cassidy? Hundreds were put to death right there. The veil turns leaden as I reach out to run my hand along the marker. Ah, no, says Jacob, shooing me away. By the time we reach the final stop on our filming list, a pub called the White Heart Inn, supposedly known for its hauntings, I'm prepared for the worst. So I'm relieved when the tap, tap, tap of the veil fades to a distant prickle. Mercifully, this pub isn't haunted, at least no more haunted than the rest of the city, which is good because I've officially had my fair share of all things inspectors for one day. Mum and Dad and the crew head to the back of the pub to film, while Finley and I and Jacob slide into a corner booth and order food. Findlay gets up to go to the bar, but while he's gone, Jacob and I don't talk. <clears throat> I can't stop myself from thinking about what he said and didn't say. Jacob keeps his eyes pointedly on the table, trying to lift a coaster from the wood. At last, Findlay reappears, setting down two pints of beer. Um, I say, I I'm not exactly old enough to drink. He laughs, a low, rich bellow. It's not for you, he says. He pulls one glass towards him. This one's mine, he explains, nudging the other towards the empty seat at his side. And this one's Reggie's. <clears throat> I look around the pub. Reggie? Reggie Weathershire, says Finley. My old mate, this was his favourite place. My eyes widen. Mrs Weathershire's late husband, the one who's been dead for eight years. Do you think he's haunting here? I ask. Finley gives an amicable shrug. Couldn't say, but if he is, I don't want him to go thirsty. I always bought the first round. There's no sign of Mr. Weathershire, not on this side of the Vale, but Dad once told me that the living hold on to the dead, that ghosts are just our way of keeping people with us. Of course, I know there's more to it than that, but the thought of Mr. Weathershire being there in the pub seems to make Finley happy. A big bag of fries, I mean chips, comes to the table. I douse them in vinegar and pop one into my mouth. Finley chuckles. We'll make a local of you yet. I reach for another chip. Do you really believe in ghosts? Aye, he says, without a second's pause. In a sense, I believe there's something left behind when a person goes. A, a kind of memory. I've lived too long in this city not to believe it, but I don't think they really mean us harm. Laura would probably disagree with that. And even if they do, he adds, I hear you've got your own ghost for a guardian angel. A tense, but there's no teasing in his voice. There's a mischievous light in his eyes, but he's not mocking me. You've nothing to fear with a friend like that. Jacob looks up, smiles tightly. You know I've always got your back, Cass. So, says Finley, tell me about this ghost of yours. What's his name? I pop another chip into my mouth. Jacob, I say. He saved my life, I add. Finley's eyebrows go up. Did he now? Well, aren't you lucky? I cut a glance at Jacob. I am. Jacob blushes and looks down at the table. Shortly after, Mum and Dad turn up with the crew. And the rest of the meal is a lot of technical talk about the show. 
I stack towers of chips. Jacob tries to knock them down. When it's time to go, we, we all haul ourselves up, equipment and all, and head for the doors. I glance back at the table one last time and see that Mr. Weathersh's glass is empty. If they, this day has taught me anything, it's that I've still got a lot to learn. Maybe the world is even stranger than I know. The camera crew says good night, and the rest of us make our way back to the lane's end. Dad and Finley are deep in conversation. Jacob is whistling the theme song to some cartoon I can't place. And Mum has her head tipped back to enjoy the summer air. The moon is high. The night is crisp and clear and perfect. And I snap photos of the winding streets, the amber streetlights. Even though I'm not in the Vale, there really is something magical about this city. We're at the top of the Royal Mile when I hear the song. It echoes up the road, and at first I think it's coming from a street performer or a bagpiper. But the street is empty, dark, and the sound is crystal clear. It's a woman singing. Her voice snags in my head like a hook, slowing my steps. I know that song, or rather, I know the voice of the person singing it. Because it's not a person at all. I can picture her red cloak, her black curls, her outstretched hand. I stop walking and turn in a circle, searching for the song. It's so close, I want to find it. I need to find it. Do you hear that? I whisper. But no one else seems to notice the singing. Not even Jacob, who looks at me like I've lost my mind. I crane my head, listen, listen. But before I can find the source of the melody, it's gone. I don't hear anything but wind. Mum and Dad stay up late going over the day's footage and preparing for tomorrow's filming. I, meanwhile, head straight to bed. All I want to do is sleep and preferably dream about something other than haunted alleys and buried crypts. But sleep doesn't come, doesn't stick. I end up tossing and turning. When I close my eyes, I see the broken tunnels of Mary King's Close, the way a dozen sickly faces turn toward me. The scene dissolves and I'm above ground. Laura Chowdhury standing in the street, the mirror pendant hanging from her fingers. Watch and listen. See and know. This is what you are. It's the middle of the night when I throw off the covers and get up, nearly tripping on Grim. I slip out into the living room. The door to my parents' room is ajar. But the lights are out and I can hear Dad snoring softly. Jacob! I whisper, hoping he's nearby, but there's no answer. I cross to the old-fashioned desk beneath the window. My camera sits on its purple strap in a pool of moonlight. I pick it up, look at the counter on top. I've got ten pictures left on the reel. I turn the device over in my hands, intending to clean off the lens with the cuff of the pyjama shirt when I spot something. I'm not usually on this side of the camera, so I never noticed the way the lens reflects like a piece of glass or a mirror? Is this why Jacob never looks at the camera when I take his picture? How many secrets is he keeping? How many things do I still have to figure out?